Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Nina Holotova, and I am a lawyer and program coordinator at the Community Legal Education Association, also known as CLIA. For those of you who aren't familiar with what we do at CLIA, we are a nonprofit charitable organization, and our mission statement is unknown rights or not rights at all. We've been working to improve access to justice, by providing education, information, and other resources to Manitobans about their rights and the law, and we have been doing this since 1984, so this means we are very much looking forward to celebrating CLIA's 40th anniversary next year. We offer webinars every spring and fall on a variety of topics, and today's topic is child protection, online sexual abuse, and exploitation of children. Just a couple of pieces of housekeeping, as always, today's presentation is being offered in webinar format, which means everyone is muted and cameras are off by default. We will have a dedicated time for some questions at the end, but do feel free to send your questions in during the course of the presentation by using the Q&A function. However, if you do have a more specific question that pertains to your particular legal situation, I encourage you to reach out to our law phone-in program to speak with one of CLIA's lawyers for free. I also kindly ask that everyone completes our very brief survey after the presentation today. As a nonprofit, feedback from our participants helps us improve the quality of our programs going forward, and it is also invaluable for our funders. Uh, with that being said, I would now like to introduce our presenter, Deborah Danko. Deborah Danko is a senior is a senior associate counsel in the legal department of the Canadian Center for Child Protection in Winnipeg, Manitoba where she has dedicated her legal career to tackling online child sexual exploitation. She joined the center as an articling student in 2013 after completing her law studies at the University of Victoria. Prior to law school, Deborah obtain, obtained a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Alberta. She is active in the Manitoba Bar Association's legal research section and women's lawyers Women Lawyers Forum. She is currently on the board of the Gas Station Arts Centre, and in 2021, she was awarded the Premier's Volunteer Award. In her spare time, she loves volunteering, getting out in nature, traveling, reading, and spending time with her dog. We are so pleased to have her here today, and without any further ado, I will pass it over to Deborah. Thank you so much, Nina, for that introduction and to Clea for having me. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for taking the time to attend or watch this webinar on the issue of online child sexual exploitation. This is an incredibly difficult subject for us to cover tonight. We will be focusing, though, on the rights of children and the laws in place to protect them, and I won't be going into any graphic details. One of the questions we are often asked after presentations like this is how we do this work on a daily basis. And it is not easy, but we do have a very supportive team here and we are fortunate to be doing something to improve the situation facing children online. So if you're finding anything disturbing or triggering that is completely valid, please do what you need to manage how you're feeling, including taking a break if you prefer. So who are we? As Nina mentioned, I am a senior associate counsel in the legal department of the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. We currently have a team of six lawyers, a legal assistant and a law student. The Canadian Centre is a registered charity located here in Winnipeg, and we operate a number of programs and services nationally, all aimed at enhancing the personal safety of children and bringing down the level of child sexual abuse in Canada. We Oh, sorry, we grew out of Child Find Manitoba, which was founded in 1985, and at that point it supported families who were searching for a missing child. In the late 90s, we started to realize that the internet was going to play a role in children being contacted by those with intent to harm them. So this led to the launch of cybertip.ca, which is our most public facing program because anyone, any Canadian can come in to our website or call to report any concern about online child sexual exploitation or abuse. One of the main concerns we receive reports about is what's referred to as child pornography in the criminal code, um, but throughout this presentation, I will be using the term child sexual abuse material or the acronym CSAM, because simply this is more accurate way to describe this content. Um, there is also a bill, Bill C-291, that would replace references to child pornography in the code with the term child sexual abuse and exploitation material. So, but frankly, the law has been slow to catch up, and I generally won't be using the outdated term child pornography. So, that said, 
FiberTip was launched as a pilot program here in Manitoba in 2002. In 2004, it, we went national after being adopted under the federal government's national strategy for the protection of children from sexual exploitation on the internet, a strategy that continues to be in place today, and we still play an important role in it with police and other allies. The reason having a centralized tip line like cybertip.ca is so important is because online crime has no borders, whereas police forces operate generally within their jurisdiction. So when someone reports to cybertip, the analyst who receives the report will determine how to, to um, action it, which means identifying which police force to send it to and if it goes to child welfare authorities. On that note, under Manitoba's Child and Family Services Act, Manitobans are required by law to report concerns about child sexual abuse material. This is called mandatory reporting, and the goal is to facilitate the identification of children potentially in need of protection. This reflects the fact that CSAM is not just a police matter, it's also a child protection issue. It also reflects the fact that the internet hasn't traditionally been policed, so we need citizens to tell us when there is something of concern. When the tip line first started in 2002, it was mainly adults reporting something they believed was child sexual abuse material that they had bumped into online. Over the years, we started to hear more from children who were essentially reporting their own victimization, and now we offer a variety of supports to them and their families. All told, we receive about 2,500 reports from Canadians per month, and we helped approximately 4,000 children and families last year. So I'm going to give a really broad overview of the issue of online child sexual exploitation and abuse. This issue has gotten more and more complex in the 10 years since I've been working with the Centre, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. It's an issue that we actually haven't always had much information about. For example, we don't really know the number of Canadian children who are victimized because, as we'll touch on later, many of them will not report what's happened to them. We do know that there is a large amount of child sexual abuse material circulating online based on numbers from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which, because it's located in the US, acts as essentially a clearinghouse for reports from the whole world. They get millions, 32 million reports last year. Um, Related to this, we also know that once something is put online, it's critical to get it removed as soon as possible because some of the material that is out there has been online for more than 20 years now, which means the victims are now adults and their sexual imagery is still out there. Um, the Canadian Centre has a tool called Project Arachnid, the purpose of which is to reduce the online availability of child sexual abuse material and provide some psychological relief to victims. It leverages automation to find CSAM on the web faster than any other method, such as relying on public reporting could, and it sends notices to the host, identifying that the image is child sexual abuse material and requesting that it be taken down. Since its inception in 2017, Project Arachnid has sent over 37 million such notices or requests. This means that abusive material is being removed, but it also provides an idea of just how much of it is online. And that's only in the sort of public areas that Project Arachnid can go. It, it can't go into password protected accounts such as media, um, email or social media. We also know that police reports of online child sexual exploitation and abuse almost tripled between 2014 and 2020. And that wouldn't even reflect the exacerbation of the issue due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So when the restrictions were in place, public health restrictions, it's no secret that things moved online. Both children and offenders were spending more time online. This resulted in a spike of what some organizations are calling self-generated CSAM or image-based sexual exploitation and abuse of children, which is the better term, I would say. Um, it's a broad concept and it can encompass sexual material that is consensually shared 
um, between peers, which unfortunately can leak out and then become traded on the internet. Um, and it also includes situations where children are coerced, manipulated, or tricked into providing sexual imagery to someone who's not who they think they are. So for example, an issue that skyrocketed during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, especially early on in uh, March and April of 2020, was what's called capping. So capping is when an individual uh, tricks a child into performing a sexual act over a video stream. The child thinks it's ephemeral, it's just a passing moment, and they don't realize that the other person is recording it. Sometimes the perpetrator just wants the video and they move on to other victims who are unfortunately easy to find on the internet. Other times they may continue to target the victim, including, for example, uh, threatening to release the capped image, which is called sextortion, and we'll talk about that later too. Um, we also know that online child sexual exploitation is happening on a variety of platforms than basically any apps or sites that children use. So not Facebook so much right now at this point in time, but um, CyberTip receives reports about Instagram, Snapchat, online gaming platforms. Discord has been a big one lately. And that's the thing is that these apps are always changing. And this is a lot for parents and police to keep up with. Um, it's also common for an incident of online child sexual exploitation to involve more than one app, and that's often by the offender's design. So if the first app where the perpetrator has met the child is too easy for the child to block on or it isn't private enough, then as a tactic, the perpetrator will often move the communications to another platform that um, is more secret or something like that. Um, Another formerly common platform, Omegle, was recently shut down after a lawsuit that was actually brought by a victim here in Manitoba, and we'll touch on that a little bit later too, but that was a very interesting development in this space. And then finally, in terms of what we know, we know the impacts of these crimes are significant. This is robbing children of their ability to live normal, connected lives online. There's anxiety, exhaustion, and trauma associated with the ongoing circulation of a sexual image. Um, it's leading some survivors to self-monitor, so try to find their own content and get it taken down. But that takes an enormous amount of time and energy. Um, some victims are being recognized in person. That does happen. And um, we are tragically losing children to suicide. So just yesterday, the news broke of a 12-year-old boy in BC who succumbed to suicide after a sextortion incident. So this is very, very serious offending, um, and there are aspects of it that are really in their own category distinct from in-person sexual abuse. Um, and on that note, this is a recent court, uh, recent quote hot off the presses from the Supreme Court that describes how a sexual exploitation encounter online is different from in-person abuse. So the court noted that since offenders cannot physically touch their victims, their power, the effectiveness of their strategies, it's often going to lie in the degree of control they can have over the victim and how they can manipulate the victim into engaging with the abuse. And this leaves the victim feeling like they actively participated in their own abuse, which can increase self-blame, internalization, shame, worsening the psychological harm. A bit about the victims. Um, for child sexual abuse material that has been circulating online, the point I want to make is that um, there's a lot of content of very young children. There's still occasionally this myth that this is usually older teens who are close to being able to legally participate. And that's irrelevant because Canada's laws protect every child up to the age of 18. Um, and that's also simply not the case. Most victims of CSAM are victimized from a young age. Studies tend to suggest that about 75 to 80% of the victims are girls. Um, but that means that there's not a not insignificant number of boys who are harmed. And according to some research, um, CSAM depicting boys tends to be more severe. For luring and related to that sextortion, we see particular vulnerability in adolescence. So these kids are curious, they have more freedom online, they are developing an interest in their sexuality, but they are not equipped to make decisions about 
whether or not another person is going to harm them. So it's just very, very notable when you read these cases that these kids are 12, 13, 14, and they're being targeted. We do also see some incredibly young children around the ages of seven or eight who just really have no defense against this type of manipulation online if they are paired with the wrong adult through a social media site, for example. And sextortion tends to follow a pattern where we actually see a lot of boy victims. So perpetrators are able to like hack or buy up social media accounts, or they might use like a looped video um, to appear exactly as an attractive young girl usually. And under that persona, they convince the youth to send them a sexual photo. Then almost immediately the threats begin, they reveal the trap and, um, if you don't, so the threats are, if you don't send me money, I will send this photo to your friends, your family, your school, which of course they know who these people are um, because they've often seen the child's friends or followers list through their social media. Um, really, really important to recognize how boys are being targeted in this space and how they are reacting because we have seen far too many tragedies where boys have very um, tragically and suddenly lost their lives to suicide after incidents like this. Um, girls, on the other hand, in sextortion is incidents, the demand tends to be more for more imagery, so not for money. Um, so the threat is, if you don't send me more images, I'm going to release what I have of you um, up to and including making fake accounts of the victim. So you pretend to be the victim on social media and then you post the image to that account. This can be really concerning, this type of sextortion, because usually the perpetrator isn't just looking for more of the same type of image. They um, the exploitation sort of escalates to the point where there's more explicit images. Sometimes it's really quite degrading. Um, and then there are also situations where the child or youth is targeted because of their belonging to um, the LS, LGBTQIA plus community or the newcomer community. Um, and in these situations, it can be that the perpetrator preys on the youth's desire to belong, or particularly for newcomers, it could be their lack of knowledge of the systems in place to protect them that makes them especially vulnerable. Um, so it's also important to recognize how children are responding when someone is attempting to exploit them online. It is much more common for them to try to block the perpetrator. That's kind of the number one go-to. They may also report it to the platform, but that's less common. It's sort of another level. And I think there's some skepticism about what the platform will even do. Um, the problem, though, is that blocking um, a perpetrator in this situation isn't very effective. It's very easy to have multiple accounts and the child is it can be recontacted in one way or another. Um, this also means that most children are trying to manage this on their own and there's no safe adult who's even aware of what's happening. Part of the reason children aren't seeking help is because they fear getting into trouble from their parents or caregivers. And this is something that offenders will actually reinforce and tell them that will happen. So it is important to have these conversations with children and let them know that they aren't going to get into trouble. This is just too big for them to manage on their own and an adult is here to help. The last thing before we get into the laws aimed at preventing this crime is understanding that offenders come from various backgrounds. Um, some are very tech savvy, but that's not a prerequisite. A lot of technology is very easy to use. Some are young. We are seeing an increase in youth court cases. So that's an area where education and intervention is going to be really important. There was uh, also a recent survey by the tip line, tip line in Finland, so kind of the cyber tip equivalent in Finland. Um, they surveyed anonymously individuals who find who use the dark web to find CSAM. There were about 2,400 2, respondents to this anonymous survey, and notably 58% of those were between 18 and 25, so young. Um, on the other hand, there are some older middle-aged and older adult perpetrators as well. There is a higher prevalence of male perpetrators, but there are also women who offend and commit these crimes. Sometimes it's with a male co-offender who they connected with online. 
There's a local story in the news right now. Some of you have probably seen it about the female hockey coach who's been charged, not convicted, um, but charged um, with sexual assault and luring some of the girls on her team. And this is actually another form of luring, which is when the offender knows the child, finds them on social media. So we've talked a lot about strangers that um, are connecting with kids through um, different platforms online, but it can cover a situation where the offender knows the child in real life and then they find the child on social media or they begin texting them and then they're able to build or build and sexualize a relationship with the child kind of out of sight. Um, when child sexual abuse material is made in person, the offender is likely to be someone the child knows, often even a family member, because that's who would have regular unsupervised access with the child. When it's produced online, when we talk about online communication offenses like luring or sextortion, um, and when we talk about those who are consuming CSAM that is being made available on the internet, that person could be anywhere in the world. And to that point, according to Statistics Canada, in the majority of child sexual abuse material incidents that come to the attention of Canadian police, no accused is ever identified. So that's something that stats can attributes to the difficulties in pinpointing the locations of people who are committing online crimes and identifying who's behind the computer, essentially. So now we're moving on to the section about the laws. So. Um, on the screen are some of the sources of rights for children in Canada. Under the Charter, children have rights associated with their safety and privacy and to equality under the law. When constitutional and other legal challenges have gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, our top court has consistently said the protection of children is a fundamental Canadian value. When children are victims of crime, they also have rights under the Canadian Victims Bill of Rights, which applies federally and was enacted in 2015. This includes the right to have their privacy and safety considered in the course of criminal proceedings. This is all informed by Canada's international commitments under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Canada ratified in 1991. Associated with this convention, there is an optional protocol specific to certain forms of child exploitation, including child sexual abuse material or CSAM. It requires parties to protect victims of these crimes and pass appropriate laws to prohibit them from occurring. And in, two, in 2001, or sorry, 2021, mm -hmm. the um, UN issued a general comment on children's rights in the digital world. So the digital comment explains how states should implement the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in an online environment. The comment's very broad. It's not just about uh, sexual exploitation. It's also about privacy, access to information, right to education. Um, but it is a clear call for parties to the Convention on the Rights of the Child to implement safeguards for children online. And that's important because there haven't always been those safeguards. So in um, this is a little bit of history on internet regulation in Canada and the US because that's relevant to kind of how Canada's laws have been uh, developed. So in 1999, the CRTC, sort of our communications and television radio regulator, decided not to regulate the internet. This was after they had studied the matter for about a year, and at the time they determined that it wouldn't um, further the object objective, sorry, of the Broadcasting Act, which is where they get their powers from. Um, they also determined that there were existing laws for things like child sexual abuse material, and at the time industry was setting its own standards. Around the same time in the US, something called COPPA or the Children's Online Protection of Safety Act came into play and it basically required commercial websites to obtain parental consent to collect the personal information of users under 13. So this basically meant that having um, a parent's permission to create an account was required if you were under 13. There was some concern at the time that this was too young, but the law went ahead anyways. And basically now, again, if you are 13 or older, you can have a social media account or whatever. Um, of course, companies don't perfectly adhere to this standard. There's lots of ways to lie and get an account when you're younger. Um, but for all intents and purposes, um, 
this law, essentially, it became accepted that 13 was a reasonable age to use social media and that sort of thing. Although, of course, at the time, social media wasn't really what they were concerned about. Um, but as social media came into play and we had this 13 year old standard, um, what it kind of meant was that many people, um, many of these children were on the same social media networks as millions and millions of adults. Oh, sorry, one more thing on this one. Um, there's also something called Section 230 of the U.S. Communications Decency Act, which is a very ironically named piece of legislation. Um, and to date, Section 230 has largely prevented platforms, so Facebook, Twitter, um, from being legally responsible for what their users post. So if a company isn't liable for the harmful things that their users post, you have to ask where is the incentive for them to remove or prevent this content. In fairness, as I've kind of alluded to, the internet looked a lot different when these decisions were made. Um, this was before smartphone, smartphones, the explosion of social media platforms, live streaming, and now artificial intelligence. Excuse me. So in the absence of regulation and safeguards, online child sexual exploitation has basically been dealt with as a criminal law matter, um, as well as child protection. There are uh, some issues with this approach, but nevertheless, it's important to understand what Canada has criminalized to understand how um, this might inform where we need to draw the lines when it comes to what's happening on online platforms. Uh, we're mostly going to go sequentially through the laws in the order that they were introduced to the criminal code, but this one is central to most of those laws that we have in the code, and that's the age of protection, or what's more commonly called the age of consent. So in Canada, that age is 16, but there can be no consent if the youth is uh, 16 or 17 and the other person is in a position of trust or authority, the youth is dependent on that other person, or the relationship is exploitative of the youth. Um, for children aged 12 to 13, there is a two-year close-in age exception, so consent can occur with a similar aged peer. And then for children 15 or 14 and 15, it's five years. Anything outside of these bands is prohibited by law. So again, this is referred to in the criminal code and often still the media as um, child pornography, but I will be using the term child sexual abuse material or CSAM. This law was actually brought in in 1993, so that's 30 years ago now, again before high-speed internet, Google, smartphones, um, but even then there was a recognition that the internet was going to provide a distribution channel for this material that simply never existed before. It actually used to have to be mailed, um, so something uh, so something needed to be done, and this at this point, Parliament actually created this standalone offense to deal with what would have previously been prosecuted as obscenity, which is a very obscure, rarely used crime with some constitutional baggage. So there have been um, some amendments to this provision over the years, but in its current form, it prohibits the production distribution or possession of CSAM. One of the newer parts of the law is the prohibition on accessing, which is a recognition that you could go online and see CSAM without ever taking possession of it. So um, basically now any, any sort of contact or use of CSAM is prohibited. CSAM is radioactive in a sense. This applies to any sort of visual material, including sculptures or dolls. There's some recent case law on the issue of dolls, and a consensus is developing that so-called child sex dolls are illegal, um, assuming they meet the other criteria for the offense. Uh, the stipulations are that the visual material must depict explicit sexual activity, and here we should think of the word explicit not as meaning that the sexual activity needs to be extreme or graphic, but in the sense that it must be plain or apparent when you look at the visual. And the other form of prohibited material is where there is no sexual activity, but the image shows a child and the dominant feature of the image is the child's sexual organs, and it's for a sexual purpose. And that person is or is depicted as being under 18, which means how the age is presented matters. You can be under 18 or you can be presented essentially as under 18 for these laws to be in place. 
As the Supreme Court of Canada declared in a seminal 2001 case on the constitutionality of these laws called RV Sharp, the purpose of all of this is to protect children from being sexually abused in the production of this material, to reduce the market for it, and to prevent the harms associated with viewing it, such as the incitement to fantasies that could lead to offending. So quickly, here's the provision. You can see the different types of visual CSAM. You can also see that written and audio material are included in the definition. So we'll come back to that because we're gonna talk a little bit about what is not required for something to amount to child, child sexual abuse material under Canada's definition. So nudity is not required. This is a big one here. Um, the child does not need to be nude in the image. Canada's definition is broad enough to cover clothed images of children where the image has a sexual purpose and where the focus or other em emphasis of the image is on the child's uh, sexual organs. There's also no requirement for it to be a real child. Remember that I had highlighted that word depicted um, in the uh, definition. So it can depict a child, not necessarily um, that the person is a child, but that they are depicted as such. This means that in contrast with some other countries, Canada's laws cover things like anime, cartoon, CGI, child sexual abuse material. Um, this is going to be especially important with the rapid growth of artificial intelligence, which is adding another layer to this issue. Um, so AI is being used to generate CSAM. It can basically swap out a child's face onto existing pornography. It can also be used to nudify so visually, virtually, sorry, remove any child's clothing and produce sort of a fake visual of what they would look like nude. Um, so this should be covered through existing laws, but it's something that we need to keep in mind is changing the landscape a little bit, and there may need to be some amendments made um, to deal with this type of material. And then finally, as I mentioned, Canada's laws also cover written and audio material that is sexual or pornographic. Um, so stories or material that advocates or counsels illegal sexual acts with a child. Um, this is important when you consider the amount of written communication, stories, blogs, other posts happening online. If those posts describe or promote illegal sexual activity involving a child, um, then there may be an avenue to prosecute those involved with that type of um, activity. Moving on to other image-based crimes, uh, so voyeurism and the non-consensual distribution of an intimate image, both of these apply to children and adults. In the case of children, there can be an intersection with child sexual abuse material. Um, each crime basically will have its own elements or ingredients, and sometimes the same image or incident will meet all of the uh, elements, and other times the offenses could be completely separate. So. Um, the offense of voyeurism was added to the criminal code in 2004 as section uh, 162. This was after a consultation in 2000 that noted that for all of technology's many benefits, it has introduced new threats to our privacy and sexual integrity. This offense again applies to both children and adults, and it applies to both observation, so kind of the peeping Tom scenario, and recording, which creates a permanent record and can involve zooming in on the subject and taking the video or image. It also, it prohibits secret recording in certain scenarios. We've had some nice helpful Supreme Court of Canada guidance on this offense. Most recently, we had the Downs decision where the court emphasized that in enacting this offense, Parliament essentially designated a class of safe spaces where you can't be recorded without your knowledge. So spaces like bathrooms, change rooms, and bedrooms. And then regardless of location, you can't record anyone who has a reasonable expectation of privacy or is nude and is nude or engaged in sexual activity. So, and then there's actually something of a catch-all phrase in, in C there on the screen, which prohibits the secret recording or observation whenever it's for a sexual purpose. Again, as long as the subject has a reasonable expectation of privacy in the circumstances. So in a completely public display of say, nudity or something like that, you're not gonna have an expectation of privacy, but in a lot of circumstances, you're not expecting to be recorded and it could be covered by this offense. 
Um, the Jarvis decision, also a Supreme Court of Canada decision that provided a lot of guidance on this. So that case involved a teacher who used a pen camera to record his students and he essentially was secretly capturing uh, images of their cleavage. And this happened in a classroom, so they were in a semi-public space, but it was within a school and they would have expected to be free from the type of recording that they were subjected to. So this is a good case for contextualizing the question of when someone has a reasonable expectation of privacy and the recording is off limits. And then in 2015, the non-consensual distribution of an intimate image offense was enacted, sort of as an adjunct to voyeurism. It's uh, section 162.1 of the criminal code. This was a really important development and it came after the tragic loss of multiple Canadian children to suicide um, after their sexual images were circulated around their schools. So their parents became very powerful advocates. Something needed to be done. And this was Parliament's response to the weaponization of sexual images to shame, harass, hurt, coerce, control someone, or just violate their privacy. Um, so for an image to qualify, it must have been made in circumstances of privacy. It must still be private when it is distributed without consent, and it must show the person nude exposing a sexual part of their body or engaged in sexual activity. So some nudity or exposure does seem to be required for this offense. In terms of modes of distribution, I've seen some cases where the accused showed one other person just kind of held up their phone and showed it. Um, so that can qualify. And it goes all the way up to cases where uh, the image is placed on a site like Pornhub or myx.com, along with the victim's name and other personal information. And it racks up thousands of views before someone alerts the victim to it. Part of the reasoning behind this offense too is that we needed an avenue to deter the sort of sexting gone wrong scenarios, um, perhaps among youth where prosecuting these crimes as child pornography offenses just wouldn't really make sense given all the stigma that that crime carries when it's to youth and the image was originally consensually created. So there have been many news articles about um, situations in schools where multiple children are sharing kind of within a circle images of their peers and that sort of thing. And of course, when we're talking about youth, we need to bring to bear all of the alternative measures in the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Um, but it is important that we have the right offense when we are sort of having our entry point into the justice system. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that although they're youth, the, the victims are also, also youth and they have certain rights as well. Um, finally, we also see the non-consensual offense um, a lot in the context of intimate partner violence. Um, so alongside charges of assault, criminal harassment or uttering threats, it is really a form of sexual, often intimate violence. And it when you realize how devastating it is for the victim, it's no wonder that we needed a new offense to address this significant and usually quite deliberate harm. Um, just a quick note that there's actually a specific peace bond aimed at concerns about non-consensual distribution of an intimate image. Anything that can prevent an image from going online or being shared in the first place is really important because once something out there is out there, containment can be very difficult, especially if it's put up on an openly available pornography site, like I mentioned. Okay, so moving on to communication offenses, I mentioned that the launch of CyberTip was connected to concerns that adults could um, communicate with children and convince the child to meet up in person with that adult. The online luring offense in section 172.1 of the criminal code came into law in the same year as the tip line as CyberTip was piloted here in Manitoba, so in 2002. Um, the luring offense covers communication, which could be text, messages, emails, etc., for the purpose of facilitating a sexual offense against a child or a person the accused believes is a child, which is that last part is really important because that leaves room for undercover, for police to conduct undercover work where they pose as a child. 
As long as they're presenting as a child and the accused forms the requisite belief that they are talking to a child and they nevertheless persist in facilitating a sexual offense, this can lead to a conviction. This is a what's called a preparatory crime. So it's aimed at stopping these other sexual offenses such as sexual assault or the production of child sexual abuse material. It's aimed at stopping those offenses from happening or as the Supreme Court put it, closing the cyberspace door before the predator gets in. So facilitating is a really important word in this offense and it has been interpreted to include grooming a child. Um, so here's the offense. You can see the elements that I've sort of bolded of telecommunication, communication with someone believed to be a certain age. Um, the ages correspond to criminal offenses and the Crown must prove that the child was the relevant age depending on the offense being facilitated. Um, but back to the issue or concept of facilitating and grooming. Grooming does look very different in every instance because it's exploiting something about that child and it's building that child's trust and breaking down their inhibitions. So online grooming may look like compliments, sending gifts, there's like ways to send online flowers and that sort of thing, um, showing an interest in something the child cares about. There's usually a gradual sexualization of the communications. So the initial communications may not seem inappropriate on the surface, but it's a process of building rapport and creating emotional dependency. And this can make it very confusing for the child. They may think there's something legitimate about the relationship and then they want to keep it a secret in order to preserve it and because they don't want the other person to get into trouble. Um, so going back to the word facilitating, grooming is all about making it easier to commit a sexual offense against a child. And when it happens online, it may be covered by the Lorraine offense. Um, so some things that aren't required for Lorraine. Again, Lorraine is a preparatory or in incohate, which is a fancy way of saying incomplete crime. This offense is not about a meeting. If a meeting happens and a sexual offense occurs, that's a separate offense. This is aimed at preventing that meeting from ever happening. Um, explicit language is not required. Grooming doesn't have to look like graphic requests or sexual messages, um, or sorry, luring. Grooming is effective because it isn't explicit. It's that rapport building process. So that not um, explicitness is not something that's required. And then the duration, it's not, there's no requirement for this to go on for a long time. Um, it can look like befriend, befriending the child and gradually introducing sexual subjects, but the Supreme Court of Canada has also said that luring can occur within even one message. Uh, a couple of related offenses that were brought into the code in 2012. Um, so making sexually explicit material, this offense is in section 171.1 of the code and it criminalizes the display, distribution, distribution, et cetera, of pornography to a minor for the purpose of, again, facilitating a sexual offense against that child. Um, this can happen in person too, but it is increasingly something that happens as part of online luring. So the accused sends the child a video or a link to a pornography site. Um, and when the offense was brought in, there was a recognition that showing a child pornography could be part of the grooming process, could be used to introduce them to sexual behaviors and normalize those behaviors. So the defense or offense story is designed to deter that from happening. And then we also have agreement or arrangement. So while Lorraine is aimed at the communications between an adult and a child or someone who's not within that close in age gap and, and the child, um, this one is more about communications between two adults. So with the ease and secrecy of online communication, it was important to prevent tele telecommunications from being used to plan to harm a child. So this offense prohibits reaching an agreement or making arrangements to commit um, to sexually harm a child, basically. So it's sort of like a spe very specific conspiracy offense. Um, and with this offense and luring, it gives police a way to, to um, conduct preventative undercover work because if they're in a space that's known to be frequented by someone who has sexual interest in children or people who have sexual interest in children and they get wind that something has happened, they don't just have to sort of watch it happen. Um, they can act on it before the child is born. 
Some other offenses in the criminal code that might be engaged when a child is exploited online are listed here. Um, we can't get into all of them, but something to, to know about is Bill C-13, the uh, bill that brought in the non-consensual distribution of an intimate image offense, so 2015 bill, um, also added section four sub eight of the criminal code, which is an interpretation section, clarifying what amounts to communication. So, um, for example, criminal harassment has an element of communication, like saying things to make the child fear for their safety. So once this interpretive section in eight, uh, sorry, four sub eight was added, there's now no doubt that crimes like that can be committed online. Um, extortion, as I've mentioned, currently a huge issue. Um, some advocates have called for a specific law against sexual extortion. Now there's no doubt that the current law is broad enough to cover um, threats to release imagery in order to, to make a child do something that the perpetrator wants them to do. Um, having a separate law may make sense in terms of process because extortion is actually so serious that it can only be prosecuted by indictment, which may be a hurdle in some instances. Um, so perhaps some sort of law uh, reform is something to watch for here, but at the same time, extortion sort of paired with luring or paired with a CSAM offense is kind of capturing a lot of those sextortion incidents. Um, just on extortion, our advice is do not meet the demands of the extorter. Usually this doesn't help. It only gives them more fuel. So we looked at some Reddit. There's actually a Reddit forum where victims of sextortion were posting um, about their experiences. And according to these accounts, when the victim sent money in the vast majority of time, it was like 93% of the time um, that even when they sent the money, that was only met by more and more demands. And then finally, the commodification offenses. So the internet is playing a role on the um, sort of sale of children's sexual services through websites like Backpage, Backpage which is now defunct, but there are always new sites. Um, so when police are able to set up operations on these sites, it's remarkable how many would-be purchasers of sex do not care when they are told that the person that they're talking to is a minor. So as an illustration, there was in the news recently that police in Durham had um, recently posted an online ad on sort of an escort site. And the ad was intended to create the illusion that individuals could purchase sex from a minor. According to a press release that the police released. Um, the ad was viewed over 6,000 times and about 600 different phone numbers contacted them. So I haven't seen the ad. I don't know. It's possible that these people had no intent to actually purchase sex from a minor, but those numbers are staggering to the point where even if, even if a small percentage of them thought that that's what they were doing, that would be hugely concerning. Um, and then switching gears to non-criminal avenues, there's a civil law in Manitoba called the Intimate Images Protection Act that allows the plaintiff to sue and recover damages from someone who has distributed their image, which has the same meaning um, as the, their intimate image, which has the same meaning as the uh, definition in the criminal code. So this can be an alternative to criminal proceedings or in addition to. It has been in place since 2016. In one case we know of um, where this uh, law was used, the plaintiff was awarded damages of $60,000. Um, several other provinces have enacted similar legislation or a tort has developed through common law and the claims are essentially coming out in that range or more. Um, so some notable features of this law are that it is actionable without proof of damage. It designates an entity to provide supports to individuals who have been victimized or who are worried that their image may be distributed. And that entity in Manitoba for young adults is CyberTip. So the assistant CyberTip um, can provide provides um, will depend on the circumstances, but basically we supply information about instructions for contacting sites to get images down. In some cases, direct assistance by notifying the site. We provide basic information about the Intimate Image Protection Act, so not legal advice, obviously, but information. Um, we provide advice, or sorry, information on protection orders, and we also encourage the victim to take self-care and seek supports if the victim is a child 
we may help engage the school so that there's the right safety planning happening, that sort of thing. Um, there are some things in addition to damages that can happen under the legislation, including um, that the, the court can make an order that the defendant must repay any profit made from the distribution of the image and also issue an injunction. So presumably to prevent the image from being distributed again. Um, there was an amendment just this year to put in a reverse onus. So where it's presumed that um, there is no consent to distribute. So if the defendant is saying, I put, yes, I did it. I posted the image online, but I thought I had the person's consent. They actually have to prove that the complainant did in fact provide such consent. Um, and then on regulation, which is sort of a different topic that we'll be wrapping up with, um, there is a shift that's coming. It's been gradual. I would say um, when I started practicing law or first of all, in law school 10 or so years ago, I didn't learn anything specific to technology. It was the wild, wild west online. And it seemed like that was always going to be the state of affairs. Um, of course, the internet is global. So here we're not just looking at Canadian laws. So in the US, there have been lots of proposed laws winding their way through their complicated federal system. Perhaps more promising though, is that there are many, many lawsuits proceeding on a product design basis in the US, which is different from the idea that companies should be responsible for the actions or, or posts of their users. The concept here is that even if companies aren't responsible for how people use their services, they are responsible for how they design their products and the safety measures that are or aren't in place. So um, one of these lawsuits is the one I mentioned earlier that actually ultimately led to a settlement and the very recent shutdown of Omegle, which was a chat roulette site, um, which sort of paired strangers. There was a CBC article on this, I think at the beginning of the year, and one of their reporters went on and basically everyone using the site was just exposing themselves. Um, so this site paired a Manitoba girl with a man who went on to lure her and other girls. And she's recently spoken out in the media saying that getting this site shut down was an important part of the settlement for her. Um, and the founder of Omegle, to his credit, um, was quoted as saying, I thank AM, those are the initials that she can be identified by. I thank AM for opening my eyes to the human cost of Omegle. And there's human costs associated with all of these platforms. Um, so this is really significant development. Uh, just last month, the UK passed ca comprehensive legislation that will mandate things like removing CSAM quickly and preventing children from accessing harmful content. Australia has a regulator. They are actually embroiled in a bit of a fight with X, formerly Twitter. Um, this e-safety commissioner there is fining Twitter or X for not complying with a transparency notice related to child sexual abuse material. So now a transparency notice is something that the regulator can issue to require companies to provide more information about their mitigation strategies, um, how they're keeping harmful content off their service. So apparently X was less than forthcoming in their report to the e-safety commissioner. Um, and you might be thinking, well, I only use X for news and that's what most of us use it for, but it also has had a serious CSAM problem over the years. So anyway, um, it is fighting the fine, but just the idea of this fine being issued is, is quite novel and um, yeah, we'll see where that goes. And then in Canada, we do have a Senate bill on age verification to access to pornography. So that's bill, uh, S210, which would make it an offense for organizations to make sexually explicit material available to young persons through the internet. Um, it's passed the Senate and it's in the House of Commons. And the government has done a consultation process. Um, then they held a public process and then they held expert advisory sessions and roundtables across the country. Legislation was promised for earlier this year and then for the fall, but then of course there was a cabinet shuffle and that sort of thing. So the group of some of the experts who were on that panel that I mentioned, um, they've actually recently publicly called for the legislation to be tabled, just recognizing all these online harms that are happening and, and piling up. Um, so hopefully we'll see something soon that's made in Canada. Um, and 
hopefully that will involve sort of safety by design and regulation. Um, so that's what we need to be moving to. Basically, these platforms are products and they need to be designed safely with um, age verification, prevention of CSAM, that sort of thing. We do need to leverage technology, but at this point, AI is one tool. We need human moderation and we also need standards for human moderation so that the people who are doing that important work aren't burning out. Um, we need a regulator. Australia is a really good example. We need to recognize this as a public health crisis facing children and respond accordingly. So not leaving this up to parents because we wouldn't do that if we took a public health approach. Um, there needs to be efforts at all levels of government to ensure victims have access to non-judgmental support, help with image removal, and practical advice on how to report things, and of course, counseling and other support. Um, on that note, when it comes to seeking support for a child in your life, here are ways you can contact the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. So needhelpnow.ca is exactly what it says. It's a place where youth can turn when they're worried about a sexual image of them online or that may be online. It has all sorts of information about their rights, how to get images removed, and it can link them directly to our support team. Um, the other link there on the screen will also take you directly to a page that's meant for survivors and will help them um, get help. And then um, the message that I want to end on, and I'm sorry to not leave a little bit more time for questions within the hour, but uh, we can stay and we can stay and answer any questions you have. Um, but I just want to end by saying that this is too big for children to manage on their own, but they're not alone and it's never too late to get help. Thank you.